thank you all so much for coming to this talk with Kwon Q Lai and uh, Dr. Narina Med. Um, I want to especially thank everyone because we're all on Zoom all the time now. Um, <laughs> so choosing to spend your your free time in the evenings or wherever you are to get back on Zoom is, is impressive. And I thank you so much for all being able to do that. Um, for those of you who aren't local, Belmont Books is located in the greater Boston area. We're an independent bookstore um, and we do regular events throughout the week. We have a pretty robust events calendar now that things have gone digital. Um, the only other event we have this week is on Thursday the 21st with Pamela Painter, who's in conversation with Virginia Pye. Um, and it's a collection of short stories. So I hope you sign up for that. Um, and then I guess we'll just introduce the authors. They will, or the doctors, we will turn it over to them. They will talk. Uh, there, there are slides and have a Q&A about the last 15 minutes or so, so about quarter to eight. Um, please put your questions in the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. That way we won't miss them in case you, you know, put them in chat, we might not see them. So let's get started with our bios. So we're here to talk about Kwon Kyu Lai's memoir, she is affiliated with the Harvard Medical Fac Faculty Physicians and currently divides her time working near the Boston area in clinical medicine and volunteering with various humanitarian organizations in disaster response or in refugee camps all over the world. She spends her free time painting, which you might be able to see some of her work at the Belmont Art Gallery and running, which is something I will never understand. <laughs> um, Dr. Narina Med um, is an accomplished doctor. <laughs> I was going through her bio earlier and I was very impressed. Um, and it makes sense why these two would be paired together as Dr. Ahmed has done quite a significant amount of work um, in humanitarian efforts and founded Critical Care Ultrasound, which brings ultrasound technology to Bangladesh. Um, and we're so happy to have both of them. I was asking them beforehand how they met and I thought it was a, a pretty interesting story. So I do hope they share it with you at some point <laughs> during the talk. Um, but that's it for me. I'll pop back in a little later. Thank you both for, for coming and doing this and take it away. Great, thank you Amanda. And thank you. Uh... Dr. Nareen Ahmed for uh, joining me this evening. And I want to thank you all for taking part of your evening to join us in this conversation. Uh, it's kind of a big sacrifice. And I would like to uh, take a few minutes to talk about, a little bit about myself and read a few passages from the book and show you some slides. I uh, was born on an island called Penang. Uh, in the western part of the Malin Peninsula in Southeast Asia. You see there's a little dot here. And um, sometime in the, in the 50s, uh, we were then still a British colony. The United States came to this island and set up a United States Information Service, or we call it USIS, and in this building. My secondary school teacher took us out on a field trip in the hot afternoon, and he told us that we could borrow books free of charge from this library in this house. And unbeknownst to him, that free library opened up my world. I began to read avidly, and I learned about Dr. Tom Dooley, who went to Cambodia and Vietnam to set up hospitals for the poor. About the same time, a friend of mine in secondary school told me about Dr. Albert Schweitzer, who also went to, who went to Africa to set up a hospital for the poor in Gabon. These two men inspired me when I was at a young age, and I told myself that sometime I should spend part of my life in doing some humanitarian work, uh, working with the poor. So the Asian tsunami of, two, of uh, I think it was 2005, devastated lots of Southeast Asia. 
And so I saw a lot of pictures on television that kind of broke my heart. And I said to myself that I really needed to go there to help out. And that was my very first humanitarian mission. I spent about three weeks uh, in South India uh, taking care of patients uh, in, in that region. And when I returned, I decided that it was time for me to leave academia and to do some humanitarian work. In 2007, I volunteered with the Clinton HIV AIDS Initiative. At the time, they, uh, the Clinton Foundation was setting up an AIDS clinic in Dar es Salaam, the capital of Tanzania in Zanzibar, this island, and also in a rural area called Mutwara. And Mutwara is a rural village that they sent me to in the southeastern part of Tanzania. And I want you to have some idea about the first hospital I saw in, in Africa when I first went there. So let me read the first reading about Tanzania. Poverty abounded in Mutwara. This was very much evident in the hospital and clinic. Ligula Hospital was built in 1964, and it probably had not changed a great deal from when it first opened. The clinical treatment center shared space with a regular outpatient clinic and only opened on Wednesday and Thursday. HIV patients mingled with the regular patients and were not singled out. The waiting rooms were always crowded with patients sitting on benches or lying on the floor, waiting patiently. Flies swarm around open wounds settled on the eyes and lips of the patients. During the rainy season, the ceiling leaked onto the floor and the patients waded through ankle deep water to see their doctors. And one morning, Dr. Mandor and I took a long walk along a corridor crowded with many waiting relatives almost all women, to make rounds in the hospital. He pointed out a rotunda in the hospital compound where the women cooked. The hospital did not provide food for the patients. Relatives cooked for them and provided 90% of the nursing care. The ward was a long building lined on both sides with wrought iron bed with peeling white paint, placed only a few feet apart from each other. Blue or hunter green mosquito nets tied up for the day hung from the ceiling. The patients brought in their own sheets, and when all of the beds were full, two patients shared a bed, their heads resting at different ends. Dr. Mundo took Christine and me to the Frilimo, the maternity ward. Used to house exiled Mozambicans who formed Frilimo or the Mozambique liberation front in 1962, seeking to overthrow the Portuguese colonial rule in their country to gain independence. At the reception, a very pregnant woman lay on a bed covered with a dirty brown sheet. This room opened into a ward with three beds, each equipped with a pair of large blood-stained canvas stirrups. A pregnant woman occupied a soiled vinyl bed with no sheet, and another arrived on her own two feet, alone and unescorted. She was led to an empty vinyl bed. Off to one side was the delivery room with three beds equipped with rusty steel stirrups, lending an air of austerity and reminiscent of the butchery of medieval times. Delivery beds purportedly scrubbed clean looked ominously bloodstained. Beside one of the delivery beds, a wooden tray lined with a bloodstained rubber sheet a giant bulk syringe lying forlornly near it, was ready to see, receive an innocent newborn into the world. The old blood stains from numerous previous deliveries had set permanently into the rubber sheet. No amount of washing could ever remove them. There were three other wards, one for women post-C-section, a second for women after vaginal delivery, and a third holding women in labor. The hallway, led to a small room for premature babies, with three bassinets each holding up to four preemies, covered with mosquito netting. Naked light bulbs hung low over each bassinet, giving out fever heat. There were no intravenous blinds or respirators. Nine preemies snuggled against each other, no nurses around, only a lone mother hovering over her baby. The second reading is an excerpt from the chapter uh, about the time I volunteered in South Africa, 
This reading is about the effects of apartheid policy on the people of color. One could not visit Cape Town without paying a visit to District 6, which used to be a vibrant inner city of mixed residential areas located in the bowl of Cape Town and linked to its port. Its residents were mainly black, Cape Malays, black houses, Indians with some Afrikaans and whites. In 1966, the government decided to declare District 6 as a white-only area using the Group Areas Act, and over 60,000 residents were forcibly removed by the apartheid regime. The old houses were bulldozed and the displaced people were relocated to the barren, outlying, sandy area of the city, now famously known as the Cape Flats. I spent an afternoon in one of the townships in Cape Flats, a mixture of one-story homes, two to three-story flats, tin sheds, and rows of communal outhouses lining its periphery. Newcomers squatted on the sidelines to, um, in lean-to sheds. One big living space filled the inside of the smaller homes. Beds rolled up during the day to make space for eating and cooking. Sleeping took place in the same tight quarters. Clothes fluttered from the common courtyards with scattered outhouses. Children ran around barefoot and stayed out of the hot container homes. The District Museum of District 6 portrayed the history of apartheid and its effects on the ordinary people through an intimate look at their personal stories, belongings, and interiors of their homes. On the ground floor was a large map where residents could leave their comments. There were old street signs, the bench with its whites only plaque, and countless memories, moving stories retold by the people who had their lives torn apart. The most moving story of all was a story about a homing pigeon's view of forced removal. Narrated by Noor Ibrahim, one of the founders of District 6 Museum. During one of the meetings of the District 6 land restitution case, he stood up and told a poignant story of his 50 prized homing pigeons, for which he built a loft using the wood from his home in District 6 in his new home in Athlone. After a three month stay in the new home, he felt it was time for his homing pigeons to learn to fly back to their new home. He let them fly away. In the evening, he waited apprehensively, but there was no sign of his pigeons. The next day, when he drove by his old home in District 6, he said, I saw a sight that shook me to the core. My pigeons, of 50 of them, were congregated on the empty plot where our home had stood. Getting out of my car, I walked over to where the pigeons were. Very surprisingly, they did not fly away but looked into my eyes as if to ask, where is our home? My, very quickly, my third reading is from the chapter on South Sudan, uh, honing into its customs and culture. South Sudan. Andrew Warhawk, a community health nurse, told me cows and girls were highly valued in Noor and Dinka countries. Herders used spears, but often AK-47 left over from the war to guard a few precious cows they owned, while others used pounds, euros, USD, yen, yuan, etc. They traded in cows. For the Dinka, a girl brought in a highly prized dowry of a hundred cows or so, and the girl's legs must not be seen from any direction while she was being surrounded by the cash cows. Otherwise, the dowry would be considered inadequate. The groom-to-be had to bring in more cows to cover the long legs. For the newer, 30 to 40 cows would be enough. A girl who could read brought in more cows than one who, who could not. Because of the enormity of the burdensome dowry, cattle raids occurred frequently, especially in Zhongle. Only older men could afford to marry repeatedly, and most of them took girls as young as 13 for a wife. Young men without the requisite number of cows would just have to pine away or marry other tribes with much lower demand of the cash cows. Such as the tribes in the equatorial states, they only required two cows, four goats, 25 chickens, and two bags of termites. Holy cows. After seeing patients with diarrhea, malaria, conjunctivitis, and various aches and pains, 
Michael came to fetch me. He told me that the big man, the director of the Bao Payam, Philip, would like to see me. He was a stern man we met yesterday. The first thing that came to my mind was, did I do anything wrong that offended the director or the community? I was thinking in terms of my running, although I checked with Johnson beforehand about dress code, running, etc., or my interactions with the people. It was past noon. The sun was hot, and I was thankful to have my hat. During the several hundred meters of walking to the director's hut, I felt like I was being summoned to the principal's office or my boss's. Michael and I stooped down at the door to enter the catch hut. As my eyes adjusted to the darkness inside, I saw three people: the director of the payam behind the desk, his secretary David, and another man. In front of them were two empty chairs. They all stood up and shook Michael's and my hands. What amazed me was that the payam announced pronounced my name correctly, told me that it was an honor to have me in his payam, and that they would honor me with a gift. Oh no! I thought to myself. Not a goat. Sure enough, almost on cue, in came a man guiding a handsome horned creature into the hut. He was white with light brown patches of hair. The man handed him over to Michael. The creature promptly sniffed at his pants and then proceeded to nuzzle my hand, looking for food. I patted him and planted a kiss on his forehead. A broad smile appeared across the face of the director. My next fear was. Would they expect me to kill it right there and then? I had heard of such stories in which the recipient of such gift was expected to slaughter the creature in front of everyone in the village. I thanked the director the best I knew how, but wished that Johnson were there to help me as to the proper way to respond. Remembering the other day, he told me it would be very bad to refuse water when it was offered. In my mind, I wonder whether it would be rude to return the gift to the community, which this creature would serve best. I stood up and thanked him from the bottom of my heart for the gift, and murmured something to the effect that I had not, I did not eat meat. Then I wonder about whether the community would use it. He did not take the offer, but corrected me that the creature was a ram, not a goat. Yes, now that I took a look, it did have a pair of ram-like horns. He wanted to know what I would call such a creature in America. I told him that we would call it a ram. He then suggested that I take him back to America on the plane, and said if I had stayed two months or longer, there would be more great gifts. I thought to myself, the cash cows, a marriage proposal, and a dowry. I was running wild with my imagination. Well, I want to tell you that it wasn't all work when I volunteered. I am lucky to squeeze in some things that I like to do. I got to hike up、uh, Mount Kilimanjaro, and here we were at the top, and visited the Gombe Stream National Park where Jane Goodall did her research with the chimpanzees. Went on a safari on the Serengeti Plain, and last but not least, rode a donkey. I also went to Lake. Um, Nakuru um, to see the thousands of flamingos and also pe pelicans, and I rode on a donkey on Lamu Island in Kenya, right into the sunset. Thank you. Thank you, thank you so much for sharing those excerpts.、Um, it's a pleasure to see you again.、Uh, Given the last time we saw each other was in Yemen, of all places, I know Amanda. Yeah, <laughs> it was. It was pretty. That was a that experience was really for me is a, a good one because I needed to see how a country like Yemen was surviving a war, which is very tough. Yeah, yeah. I would say、um, it's a, it's an honor to be here with you. I do feel we're kindred spirits in、uh, the comment that you made about seeing、um, such heartache on the screen when these disasters happen all over the world, and、mm -hmm. uh, wanting to run where you can to see where you can help.、Um, there is something that you mentioned、um, that I, I wanted to chat about a little bit. I, I'm just I'm so amazed by all of your experiences. I, I learned so much from reading your book and just hearing from you. Um, what I'd really like to hear a little bit about you mentioned in the first part of your book in Mutawara, Tanzania, 
mentoring with the Clinton and uh, HIV and AIDS Foundation. Uh, and you said something that really resonated with me because I myself have experienced it. And you kind of mentioned it in your reading as well mm -hmm. about traveling abroad on humanitarian missions and the feelings on being a foreigner and the intention that draws from the community. Um, you also mentioned about the experience of learning about the stigma of HIV, which kind of goes hand in hand about learning about, um, you know, new cultures and how medicine is seen um, and how it's how it's practiced in different countries. Can you tell us a little bit about how you navigated those challenges and what lessons you learned? Well, um, Tanzania is, is a, was the first African country that I've been to. And I, I must say that after that, I really fell in love with Africa. It's an amazing country. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, the continent with so many countries. And uh, the thing that floored me was the infrastructure of the hospital. Even though the hospital is, was built in 1964, uh, later on in my experience, I went to another hospital was built at the turn of the century, of the 19th century, so much older. Uh, this hospital was built in 19... 64 and yet the infrastructure was quite poor and there was no running water uh, No, of course no hand sanitizer. So the doctors have to make do with a lot of things and we they have no uh, They have some very rudimentary laboratory uh, Tests and a lot of the other laboratory tests they couldn't do so a lot of the treatment they have to base on their clinical um examination or clinical history. And I have to say, as far as examination is concerned, none was really done, just because there were so many patients waiting to be seen. The doctors would just ask a few questions and then would write prescription for the patient and then send the patient on the way. So it, it really bugged me for a while, but you know, I could also understand that they had maybe 50 to 100 patients waiting for a single doctor to see. They had to be very expedient in disposing the patients. So a lot of time they just based on a few questions, they would write a prescription and they send the patient on. The patients had no time to ask questions whatsoever. So that is really a very stark difference between our world and their world. And you have to kind of accept that sometimes. Although my role there was to teach them, was to be a mentor in HIV AIDS. So I try really hard to try to tell them that even though you have no time to examine the patient, you do need to examine the patients pertinent to their complaints. You don't have to do the whole physical exam, but if somebody complaining of shortness of breath or coughing, at least you would take up your stethoscope and listen to the lungs. So those are the things I try to teach them. Um, but it was hard for me because I was a woman. Um, the person that I was mentoring was a man. So it was a little bit dicey trying to uh, maneuver, you know, try to be to walking softly around him and not to f make him feel as though I was breathing on him. So I think in the end, I succeeded in uh, convincing him in a few ways to really look into the mouth for fresh, to you know, look at the skin for capsies, a coma, because they missed that. And it was amazing mm -hmm. how much pathology was missed because they didn't pay attention to the patients. So even though you don't have labs, I think there are ways to try to uh, improve the, your clinical uh, acumen and so the patients can be treated uh, properly. Yeah, um, you mentioned something that I, I definitely have experienced as well, the male-female dynamic, especially when you're coming in as a woman, as an instructor or a leader. Um, and it's interesting that you you make the same comment about how, uh, you know, really being careful about navigating those kinds of relationships, uh, because that interaction is very different for what right. we're what we have here in the US and, and what, that's experience, what that experience is like elsewhere. Um, so yeah, thank you for sharing that. Um, and I really find it so interesting, you know, you had mentioned that rudimentary labs are not available. Um, and in a disease process like HIV AIDS, where we are really basing so much of our treatment on numbers, um, I find it really miraculous what they're able to do. And can you talk a little bit more about some of the innovations that you saw outside of, you know, really um, uh, speaking to physical exam, but what other ways did you kind of get around that and, and understanding those limitations? Well, um, when I was there uh, we, in the United States, we were doing viral load and CD4 count. And the labs there, you could only do CD4 count in certain countries. And some countries have no ability to do CD4 count or viral load. So the only thing that we could really 
uh, do was to look at lymphocyte count, which is what WHO set up for countries that could not do CD4 count. So we use that as a criterion uh, that set up by the WHO, you know, as the number of CD4 um, lymphocyte count you have, and then you can try to gauge the, the immune function of the patient. But that's the best way you could. The other thing that, you know, a lot of the medicine that you give for HIV patients have a lot of side effects. And that here we monitor the liver functions, kidney functions, and that you couldn't do it. You just have to ask patients, you know, for symptoms. So you kind of treat treat the patient blindly and hoping that you, know, you kind of navigate it the right way to help the patients. So the the things that people look for that I try to teach them is to look for thrush to see whether their immune function is better because the thrush will go away. And also to look for weight gain if they are getting, you know, the immune function is returning their weight is, will, because a lot of them have wasting syndrome, so they would gain weight. Um, so those are the things that we look for, which is, you know, very poor man way of looking for improvement. And you can't really monitor their progress except by, you know, physical findings of weight gain. Uh, you couldn't even monitor their, their kidney and liver functions. So that, that was really hard for me to, uh, to swallow. Yeah, I can understand that, it's especially when we're so driven by data. Um, I think that's why these experiences often are so um, impactful for us as practitioners when we come back to the U.S., having learned to really hone in on some of those skills that maybe we don't use as often. So I think that's a really big lesson there. Um, I'm going to shift gears a little bit and kind of talk a little bit about, you know, um, some of the experiences that you mentioned really um, highlight how humanitarian work comes in different forms. Um, two scenarios in particular, and, and you kind of already hinted at them, um, one in which you serve as a primary clinical role where you're seeing and treating refugees like in the clinic in Haiti versus uh, in a teaching capacity in rounds in a hospital setting. Um, can you tell us a little bit about how those experiences differ? But more importantly, I'm very interested to hear about which of those scenarios and experiences do you feel is most impactful for the site that you're in? Well, if we talk about humanitarian missions, um, <clears throat> there are people who talk about missions that are sustainable. So a lot of time when a disaster hits a country, a lot of NGOs will arrive on the ground to try to help them which is a very noble thing because the people really need help right away and you need to get them on their feet, you know, food, shelter, medical uh, assistance. Um, but then after the immediate disaster uh, is over, there are people who think about uh, development a program or bringing the, the population up to the baseline and maybe beyond. So those are the programs that are more developmental and more sustainable. And I, I think it's a good thing that people will continue to do that. So there are two, two, two ways to look at it. People want volunteer for disaster um, circumstances. And then, you know, people, some NGOs move on. But some NGOs I've seen have stayed on to help the people. And then they start making, building up programs to help the people, like the the Project Hope that I volunteer with in Puerto Rico after Hurricane Maria, they stay on for a couple of years to they realize that a lot of the patients there have diabetes. So they thought that their program will, it was it was going to hone in diabetic teaching and teaching them how to you know control their diet and things like that, which is a very good good program to do for a population that has a high incidence of diabetes. So that, that kind of thing is, is, is a good thing for an NGO to do, short of you know trying to help them out of the disaster, we think about a long-term plan to get them better in a better condition of health. Yeah, I love that. Um, you know, I think I fully agree. I think the long-term impacts really come and how we can empower um, the physicians and the healthcare providers on the ground by providing extra support. I agree. I think there's a time for, um, you know, the rapid response in an area where there's disaster. Um, but, but I do, I think the, the medical education and teaching and support supporting that way, I think is so incredibly impactful in the long term. Um, I, I think that's, that's incredible. Um, and, you know, as you talk through many of your experiences in your book, um, there was something that that I thought really hit home for me is, um, you know, 
your experience of returning home. Uh, and, and I think that is a really interesting concept. There is the experience of going somewhere new and feeling foreign in a land that's not your own and what that, how that's perceived, but then what it's like to come home from a place where your GI tract is treated differently by different foods and you're being very cautious about drinking water. You make a comment about returning from Africa and how it felt again to be able to safely drink water from the tap. Um, I, I fully understand that and it's such an interesting moment, isn't it? Um, we really learn to appreciate so much when we travel to countries with limited resources. What else do you feel from your experience, um, you know, as a lesson from your own experience, um, what else do you think we take for granted in our day-to-day -day lives um, now that you've been to so many different parts of the world? Um, I can think of a few, but I'd love to hear from you. Yeah. Well, there are so many. Um, the drinking water, like, you know, when you are traveling from Africa into a European airport, all of a sudden you're confronted with this drinking fountain and you take your uh, Nalgene bottle and said, can I drink this water? You kind of would take a step backwards and say, can I really drink this water? I mean, yes, you can. It was so funny. And uh, the other thing that I, I would discuss was uh, flush toilets. We, mm -hmm. we kind of take that for granted because in places that I've been to, there's just a hole for, for your toilet. And so, and it's really terrible smell. You have to kind of put up with it. Um, we don't appreciate hot showers that much, but I think hot showers is something that you really hung, uh, hungry for. And running water, you know, turn on the tap, but you don't have that. You have to maybe pump your water, get water elsewhere, or from a well. So in Africa, there are many people, especially in a refugee camp, they would walk for miles just to get water for the day and may have to go a few times to get water for, for the family to use. And you also have to pump to get the water. So a chore that we know that is always delegated to girls and women, and no men or boys would do that, you know, bringing water from the well. And then, of course, there are armies of mosquitoes <laughs> to give you malaria and dengue. So I did get dengue once or twice <laughs> from uh, volunteering. And then uh, no blackouts. You know, we, we have the electricity. We just turn on the switch and we have electricity. But that's not something that is readily available in some of the villages. Um, we, they kind of depend on generator and so some petrol for the generator. So they, they try to save that. So they turn off the generator by 9 p.m. And so you have no fan, nothing, uh, no electricity, no light to guide you. So after 9 p.m., you're kind of sweating in your bed. So we, there are a lot of things we take for granted, air condition or even you know, working fan. I, I went to a place with the fans were there, but the fans were not working, had not been working for a long time. <laughs> so it's a lot of things that you uh, you do have to feel uncomfortable with, but have to get used to, to it. I think the, the most impressive thing is that, you know, it feels like such a hardship for us when we go because we're so used to the comforts of living in a country that we have all of those things, flush toilets and heat and air conditioner. Um, but but still we see some of the happiest people in these places. Exactly. Isn't that a, such a lesson? Yeah. Uh, it's yeah. incredible. The, the resilience, the happiness they show you. And sometimes you step back and said, how come these people are so happy with so little? And yet they are They're amazing. I, I think I, I really concur with what you observe. Yeah, it's really, it's really incredible. Um, I think that to me is one of the biggest lessons I learned when I come home that uh, less is more. Um, and, uh, you know, often we focus on so many of the, um, you know, the material things in life, but, uh, but happiness can be found in places where, you know, where such so many things are limited. And that's really quite a lesson. Um, and I, I think on that note, you know, I wonder, I'm curious to hear from you, um, just as a, you know, as an academician, as somebody who has really worked so hard to create this career, um, you know, and I'm shifting gears a little bit in the direction of the conversation is, I'm curious, you know, I'm young in my career and, and really trying to build on how to do what you've done, be, be able to continue to work in the U.S., but also continue these humani the humanitarian aid that you're doing. What's some of uh, the advice that you can give to folks that are early in their career looking to, you know, delve into more global health, but also still in academics? You know, I understand that's a very challenging thing. <laughs> I wish I have a golden bullet to give you, because I... Uh... 
you, you can see that I didn't do humanitarian work until my kids were older. So I, I couldn't do it when they're in school. They're, you know, I still need to nurture them. So that's the, the, the path that I took was to wait for them to grow older. And uh, you know, they, they can take care of themselves and I can go at, and do some of the things that I really want to do. I have met people who finished a training and then they'll jump into humanitarian work for a few years. Mm -hmm. But that's the thing that I think a lot of European people uh, could do. Not so much in America, because we are so into getting our certificates, getting our training. Because once you are away for three, four years, you have a big setback. When you return, you have to do all this training, all this certification. You are far away from practicing medicine. So it's a challenging thing. It's really hard for you to go back and to come back and then to resume your training. So that's a challenge that each person, when they make the decision, when to go into humanitarian work, they have to make that decision. I also met some people who are um, very lucky to be in teaching institution in which they support um, an overseas mission. And the mission, a research uh, mission or something that they have applied for, they have a research grant to do a development program in a country in Africa. And so they could spend a few months in Africa and they would come back to resume their faculty position. I think that might be an ideal thing for academician. So if you have an institution that would support, uh, would, would ha has already some kind of program like that, you know, in, outside America, that will be very good for you to be able to do this program, plus coming back and then resume your faculty position. I, I'm sure there are some of them like that, but you have to look hard for them. Yeah, that's, uh, that's good advice. I think, um, you know, for anybody with an interest in global health in any career, I think, um, or global, you know, uh, global medicine in general, I think it's, you know, it's a, a path that's paved um, individually almost, uh, you know, it's not like the rest of medicine where we see these cookie cutter pathways that exist to get to the end of a specialty or something like that, um, that, that every subspecialty has its own challenges. Um, you know, I, I, I'm an ICU doctor and it's very interesting, the pathway of how I can get involved in global health and really creating time uh, in my schedule as well. And, and I, it resonates to me, the challenges that you, that you mentioned on, on how to actually continue the work. Um, and often it's a choice of um, deciding, you know, maybe I have to give up something in order to be able to do more of the global work or something like that. Um, but certainly timing is, is a big part of it. Mm -hmm. And let me ask you, Nareen, what drew you to humanitarian aid missions? And how now, how do you integrate that into your academic career? So yeah, thank you for asking. You know, um, I would say, what you mentioned in the very beginning, um, how your heart ached to see disaster affect uh, people in a different part of the world, um, that's what drew me first and foremost. It was really an emotional connection to seeing that um, and, and realizing that um, I am extremely lucky to have everything that I have, to have the training that I have, um, and I feel a responsibility um, to give back because I can. Um, and to see that kind of pain and suffering and have some of the tools that I have to be able to go and do something about it, um, I felt that, that that was almost like a calling for me. Um, my family is from, um, from Bangladesh. And so we grew up uh, going back and forth quite a bit and seeing what it was like to, you know, for people to live in a resource poor country. Um, my, our parents would often actually take us to the hospital, the main public hospital there, just for us to see what the other side of the world lives like and what 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 we're you know what we're lucky to have here and I think that was so eye-opening um to me and then as I progressed in my career I, I looked for every way to to involve global health um I actually initially thought about doing an infectious disease fellowship um and I thought that was the only way to get into global health um but I fell in love with critical care and so I, I pursued it. And it turns out uh, no matter what you do in medicine, there's always a pathway to go out there and do something. I think right. that was something that I learned. And, um, and now I, I work with, uh, you know, the nonprofit that you and I went together with to Yemen, uh, Med Global, is one of the groups that I work with pretty closely uh, in order to continue doing the mission work, as well as also building on the medical education, something else that you mentioned. Um, that's a real passion of mine, the sustainable medical education and how we can support. Uh, I think it's wonderful. Yeah. It's really wonderful to pass on your skills to them that they can use. 
Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. And that, and that always goes both ways. I always learn so much when I'm on the ground um, from, from them as well um, about how they practice medicine, because, you know, if there's anything I learned in training is there are 20 different ways to skin a cat, so to speak. Um, you know, in medicine, you can choose three different, four different ways to treat a patient. And there's not necessarily, uh, not, none of them are necessarily wrong. It's, it's often, it's the way we choose to do something and choose to treat. Uh, and I think that's something that, that I'm always humbled by. Um, it's just learning different, exper different experiences that others have um, and, and what they're learning from that. Because, you know, if there's anything COVID has taught us, you know, I think um, is that, uh, you know, medicine is constantly changing and we are constantly learning from each other. And, and what, a, what, what an incredible, amazing experience it is for us to be able to do that. Yeah, I know the pandemic is teaching us a lot of things. <laughs> I mean, yeah. making our life difficult and at the same time I think medicine has really progressed through the pandemic yeah. and one of the other things that I want the audience to be aware of is that there I, we discussed that there's a program called PEPFA which is President's um, Emergency Plan for AIDS Relief and it was set up in 2003 by uh, the uh, US President George W. Bush and he launched it but it was a bipartisan program and over the last 15 years, it has provided more than 80 billion in cumulative funding for HIV AIDS treatment, prevention and research and saving about 20 million lives and also slowing down the spread of HIV. So I think we should, as a nation, very proud of the fact that we spend a lot of, uh, actually uh, the, our nation is the only nation that spends so much money in one disease. And it's a, it is a single disease that in, in the history of diseases that we concentrate on trying to get rid of HIV AIDS in, in, the, in the world. So we should be very proud of our country for helping, helping out and trying to eradicate an, an infection that should be eradicated, I guess, but it's not yet. Yeah, thank you for, um, for saying that. You know, I think we often, in light of all the you know political controversies and things that are happening, we often forget some of the good that uh, you know a lot of the good that our country has done. Um, so I appreciate you shedding some light on that. I think that's something that I myself didn't know much about until you had mentioned it to me. Um, I, I would like us to shift um, into the question and answer portion, if that's okay. Yeah. Um, I see uh, we have a question from um, Charles Fitzgibbon, um, and his question is, "What implications?" By the way, he's my son. Oh, he's your son. <laughs> so then you know him. <laughs> so his question, it's a great question. Um, what implications might there be for medical work such as this, considering the disparity with COVID vaccine distribution, particularly um, to the global south? What is the first one you, you mentioned? What is the... Uh, he said he was asking what implications might there be for medical work such as this, considering the disparity with COVID vaccine distribution, but particularly to the global south. The global south? The global south. South. I'm not entirely sure. Um, I, maybe that geograph meaning geographically. You mean like the developing countries? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, you know, I heard about that today that Africa would not receive vaccine, COVID vaccine, uh, for quite some time, just because the countries are poor and they are not able to buy up the vaccine that other richer countries will be able to buy. So there is a huge disparity, right, that is staring us in the face. So global health is not equal. And we know that. And so there are countries that will need help. And I think as WHO said, this is a pandemic. So every, if everyone is not vaccinated, you will not be able to eradicate the infection. So I think that them may be a call to have other richer countries to try to set up some kind of committee to try to help the poorer nations and how to equitably uh, receive the vaccine, uh, the pen, uh, the COVID vaccine for every country. So I think that that is a very great question. And I think we've been thinking about that as well. Yeah, you know, I think um, to that end, it's also very important even within our own country that there is um, equal distribution um, and that uh, of, of the vaccine. I think often, you know, we think globally as well um, as, as in our own local, 
you know, local community in, in the US that, um, that there is safe and equal distribution of the vaccine as the rollout continues. I know that's been a, a real concern for people. So, um, so hopefully that's something that continues to improve. And I, I, I'm really, you know, hopeful that people will accept the vaccine more readily than is said in the press. Um, there are people who really want a vaccine, but they can't have it. And there are people who have uh, given the vaccine, but they don't want the vaccine. So it's, the disparity is always there. And of course, people have the uh, you know, freedom of choice whether to receive the vaccine or not, because there are some people who are really fearful of the vaccine of the unknown. Sure. So I perfectly understand that. Um, so I'll shift to the next question. Uh, this is from Shirley Hargett. Uh, Adidiji, I'm apologizing ahead of time for, uh, I'm sure not pronouncing your name correctly, I apologize. Um, and her question was, um, she was saying that she's uh, not a physician, but a nurse, uh, which is a highly needed, um, oh, uh, highly needed skill out there. So, um, so that that's huge. Uh, and she's saying, I'd like to get my children involved as well with giving back. Prior to COVID, we spent time at a nursing home visiting the elderly um, and, and boy, do they love children. Um, so she's asking, uh, are there options to volunteer to help while bringing your immediate family? You mean, you mean outside globally? Yeah. Well, I have occasions, um, I think the last few years when I was in Europe, um, I think I was uh, volunteering with the Syrian Medical Society, uh, American, I think it's Sir Sam, I think it was Sam, Syrian American Medical Society. <laughs> Yeah, I went to uh, to Greece to volunteer. That was the very first time I actually ran into a family. Mm -hmm. uh, she brought her husband and her a child uh, to to this uh, mission. Although they didn't go to to the mission to take care of patients, but they were just touring Europe, and, and so she was able to kind of have have time with them after she's finished uh, her work in the day. So that was only the first time that I've seen, but in um, in some other capacities, such as in Doctors Without Borders, if you a family could actually be working, they're actually not volunteers, but they work for MSF. And so the, the parents would be working for MSF, they would bring their children over to Africa and the children would go to international school. So that, you know, that is something that, that I've seen. But most of the time, I just seen people going there alone, so I'm not sure how you take your family there. I think there are NGOs that really don't feel like it is risky for them to bring on uh, extended families to the field. So I yeah. don't think they really would approve of that. Yeah, I, I agree. I, I think it is dependent very much on where um, exactly you're going. Um, certainly in some of the more high risk areas, it might be very challenging. Mm -hmm. um, but but there there may be some areas where that's possible. But but definitely, um, you know, I can say um, one of the places I think it's that it could be possible um, is uh, somewhere I think both you and I have gone is um, the Bangladesh refugee camps, um, areas like that where it's not necessarily in a crisis war zone, but the ability to, um, you know, there are schools there and things like that. So that might be a situation where bringing kids, you know, to see the experience, um, that, that's, that's tricky though, I would say. Um, but that kind of leads into the next question, um, which is from Margot Gromal. Um, uh, nice, to, nice to hear from you, Margot. Um, and Margot, <laughs> and she has met us both on different trips, different times. Um, but she asked a really, uh, a really interesting question that I, I actually wanted to know myself, is how do you choose your missions and humanitarian projects? Um, from, uh, from what you've talked about so far, how, have you, how do you choose where you go and how do you choose in the future? I think Margot could answer that question. <laughs> I actually, um, I think when there are, there, there was one year when there were a lot of things happening. Uh, it was really hard to choose, but I was telling you that I actually would choose a, a, a project that I have, I'm very passionate about. And um, when the Rohingya were chased out, were persecuted from their homeland, that was when I really felt that I needed to be there to help them. And that they really tug at your heartstring. 
those people who suffer so much and then three quarters of a million people had to be evacuated from their homeland. So that kind of scenario really make you feel like you know these people didn't deserve that kind of fate and uh, you really needed to be there to help them. So that will be my number one thing is something I feel really passionate about. But then you know that in many, many cases of uh, volunteering, it is very difficult to find an NGO. Mm -hmm. You have to find an NGO that already has established ground other local NGOs to kind of continue with the work. You can't just go there. I've, I, I've read about people just flying there trying to you know, get by themselves or try to find an NGO when they arrive. I'm not sure whether that is a good thing to do. I think you really have to hone down on an NGO that is going there and is having a partnership on ground uh, so you can do your work a lot better, a lot more efficiently. Yeah, I think that's a really good point. Doing the research into the organizations is, is important. Um, and that kind of leads into the next question, which is from Casey Grant. Uh, and um, the question is, do you have plans for future outreach and where next? No plan. <laughs> I'm waiting for the, the pandemic to be over. I know there are many other places that I have received, um, not for us because we Americans are not really welcome because we have such a big surge, but European nations continue to have a lot of need in um, Syrian refugee camps, uh, as well as in, in Greece and as well as in the islands in Lesbos. And they are continuing to ask uh, doctors to be there, nurses to be there, but I think they are actually only asking for European doctors because in an EU country. But mm -hmm. for Americans, if you go there, I don't know whether, I know that the last time I checked, you have to have a 14-day quarantine. So it's kind of a, a stumbling block for us, you know, have to be quarantined for 14 days. Or now, I'm not sure whether they're going to be changing at all. If you're vaccinated, whether you could go, I have no idea. I think I have to wait for uh, what is going to transpire before I can say what's next. <laughs> I hear you there. I think uh, we're all struggling with that and in knowing the right timing. And I think that is one of the big obstacles that has stopped a lot of us from traveling um, to the next mission because of it. So curious to see how that changes. I, I agree with you. I'm, I'm wondering how um, the borders of the world reopen, um, you know, as the, as the pandemic progresses. Um, the next question that I'll shift to, um, this is a great question from Carl Lawson. Uh, what guidance do you have for medical students who are considering a career in global health or are considering being involved in significant global health activities? Do you have any thought? <laughs> I mean, this is a, this is Hello, a Dr. really broad question, right? Um, and, and always- awesome. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> He's a global health person. <laughs> um, so I, um, I think I think this is a this is a huge question that many you know many students from medical students to residents to fellows to even people that are you know fully in their career ask this question right How do we get involved So what's your what what would you say is some advice you would give uh, to the to the medical students and well, training? I, I kind of envy the medical students because during my time, there was not such program. And I wanted it so badly, but there was no nothing like that. And even when I went on to be specializing in infectious disease, there was no fellowship abroad you know, to do further training in uh, global health. There is no such thing that I've heard of as global health. So I think they are so lucky to have global health as they are you know, part of the curriculum. Uh, so I said that, you know, maybe think small at, at the beginning to just build up your experience, go into the country, enjoy the country, learn from the people in the country, and maybe impart your knowledge to the country. It's kind of immerse yourself in that experience and see whether that is what you really uh, passionate about. That's what you really want to do. Maybe take it one step at a time. And uh, the other thing is maybe networking with people who are in global health, uh, like maybe develop, developmental people. Um, I don't know whether, I, I know Harvard has this kind of a group for global health group that you could, if you could find a group like that to network with them because they might be a good resource to 
try to guide you as to whether you want to do administrative uh, program uh, or some kind of development program or you just want to be more medical and go in there to be a doctor. Um, maybe there are people who can guide you because I'm not in that particular position to be able to advise students, but I think the best thing for them to do is enjoy the experience as a student of global health, and I envy them. <laughs> I would agree with you. I think um, also really uh, learning about what makes them, uh, what, what drives their passion in medicine, uh, you know, deciding to choose your subspecialty and pathway uh, well, you always have a path into global health, no matter which direction of medicine you go to. Uh, so I think the advice somebody gave to me one time was, um, you know, choose, choose your path in medicine based on what you love and what will, what will make you happy on a day-to-day -day basis. What, what, what's, what are you really passionate about? And then connect that passion to global health, um, because then you're really pursuing the, the field in medicine that you love and you're pursuing it in different parts of the world where you can really find a connection and find some impact there. Mm -hmm. And I think maybe if you, you know, there are some schools that somehow join your medical school program to master public health. If they have some program like that, I would probably pursue that master in public health to try to improve your public health uh, knowledge. And that might be a good thing to have. That's great advice. Um, uh, we have our next question, who is from uh, Eleanor McCourty, who says that she's your Wellesley classmate. Um, and she says that she is in awe of your dedication to the Wellesley motto of ministering to others. Your book has so many rich details about your experiences, medical and otherwise. How, do you, how did you recall so much in so, such detail? Did you keep a journal? Or do you, just have, do you also have an amazing memory? Hopefully we'll be able to have another reunion in the future. Sweet message. <laughs> that was that was my brother's uh, conclusion as well. There's so much detail in your book. How did you keep them all? <laughs> he he was right. I I I actually kept a journal uh, with some of my missions, not all my missions. Uh, and then later on, I decided to also blog, and so I have been also blogging, not all the time, but I blog just because I want my family to be able to access. What happened to me? So they they don't have to worry about me when I'm away. Especially, I, I started blogging quite a bit when I was in Bola, so they would know that I was I was still safe. I was still okay. So that was my you know the, just to give them uh, some some peace of mind. Uh, so those kind of uh, documentations I have, so I could always go back there and uh, write my book. So I think that journalistic uh, mindset that I have. <laughs> Yeah, that's great. And that's great advice for anybody traveling and doing this kind of work is to journal so that we don't forget about the incredible experiences. Um, I'll end with this last question because I think it's a great way to end the conversation. Um, it, this is uh, another, and I apologize for any of the questions that we missed. Uh, this is uh, a question that um, it, it stated as such, in addition to learning and getting so very much from the experiences, would either of you be willing to share how the work and volunteering in resource poor settings have changed you, your relationships, friendships, approach to life, and what do you do with your free time? <laughs> that was a very loaded question. Yeah, I think the first part is maybe um, how it's changed maybe your friendships, relationships, and approach to life. Um, I think that's a great way to uh, to to end this to end end this uh, our chat with you because I think this book is really um, a commentary on that, and I'd love to hear a little bit about how it's you know overall impacted your your life and relationships. I think that if you have been to a country which has uh, very few resources and seeing how happy the people. Are, and you, you kind of realize that you have a lot and you have to count your blessing. So we have a lot and yet a lot of us are not that happy. And I, I feel as though once you kind of reach out and help the other people who have fewer things or little things like as ourselves, we actually are happier doing that way, sharing it and uh, imparting our knowledge and giving of ourselves to them. I think that's one way that you feel that happiness creep into your life and so when I come back I usually I'm very very thankful of what I have uh, my home my family so I'm kind of more more receptive of people's uh, 
you know, people's criticism of me or people's praises of me and things like that. So I think that you learn to to appreciate the things that you kind of take for granted when you're around. And so I, I think that's how I feel about going out to volunteer is actually a lot of time I benefit a lot more from helping people because they really help me in understanding what kind of person I should be. That's beautiful. I, I couldn't have said it better. I, I mean, and that really resonates with me, what you said. Uh, that's uh, uh, just such a beautiful response. Um, so I, on that note, it's about 8 p.m. right now. So uh, we'll have Amanda back. <laughs> Um, thank you both for the, the, the fabulous discussion and thank you for everyone who attended and submitted such great questions. If you popped in halfway through the talk, we did record it and it will be on our YouTube within like 48 hours so you can catch up on anything you've missed and there are links in the chat to where you can buy uh, Quan Q's book. Thank you all for coming. Thank, thanks to both of you for doing this. Thank, thank you very you much. Awesome. Us. Yeah. Yes. All right, everyone, have a good night. Stay safe. Wear your masks. Okay. <laughs> Bye. Bye. Bye.